Okay, thank you, Donna. Um, the company that I work for, Mapbox, creates maps for a global audience. Our users speak a large number of languages, and to support them, we'd like to offer labels in their preferred language. But that's a huge task, because converting labels to any new language means that we need to convert something on the order of hundreds of thousands of place labels. So we need a solution that works at scale and efficiently. I talked a little bit about our label conversion efforts last year at a talk at NASIS in Montreal with my colleague Nikki, and our, our efforts focus mainly on English to Chinese map label conversion. So to understand how well our system is doing and how to improve our work, we need to know what the ideal converted label is. And one way to do that is to is to dig into preferences about specific label conversion processes and output. So for example, translation, transliteration, whether speakers would like the label to be converted at all, whether they'd prefer to have a categorizer word. And so this talk is gonna focus on what I found through surveying ma Mandarin speakers about their preferences. So let's walk through very briefly an example of converting an English place name to Chinese. I'll convert the name Hyde Park. Um, I went to University of Chicago, so I always associate that as being a neighborhood in Chicago, although I hear there's one in London somewhere. Um, that was supposed to be a joke. Um, so <laughs> Hyde is a proper name, so you can't look it up in a dictionary and know that it means like log or something, some n very normal concrete thing. So we need to use a process called transliteration to convert it, in which we convert a sequence of sounds in one language to a sequence of sounds in another language, then we render that converted sequence of sounds into the script of that language. So hide becomes hide, uh, and then we render that in simplified characters. And transliteration is a regular linguistic process that that follows, that follows rules, and you can infer those rules based on data. And for, the, for converting English to Chinese place names, there are actually some established standards for doing that. So that was the word hide. The word park, we actually have a lot of options because it has a lexical meaning. So we could still transliterate it and preserve the English pronunciation, or we could translate it. But here there's a wrinkle because Hyde Park isn't really a park, it's a neighborhood. So we know that translation is possible, but we don't know if it's actually helpful. So that highlights the need to actually understand what users' preferences are. And apart from that example, there are other factors to consider. So we could add categorizer words that explicitly indicate the type of place that the map feature captures. Um, for example, in this, in this screenshot showing a converted place name for El Capitan, you can see the character Sean at the end of that label, and that essentially says Mount El Capitan. We could also leave the label in English. Maybe that's what speakers prefer. Maybe they don't even want us to try. They just want to know what people in the place call it and go with that. Another possibility is showing multiple labels, showing English and Chinese. That's not something that I survey in, in the study that I'm gonna talk about, but my colleague Nikki is actually presenting a talk on that today at two. So you should all go see that. So I, sur I distributed a, an online survey to 31 Mandarin speakers in China. And the questions on the survey varied the types of map features. There were human settlements, natural features, points of interest, and roads. And, with, and for a given place, the, the things that varied were the number of words that were translated in the label, whether the translation accurately indicated the type of place that was there. That's actually more of a per question variation rather than per label. I didn't intentionally mistranslate things. Um, and then also the inclusion of a, of a categorizer word like mountain or street, and whether, and users were given, or participants were given the option of just leaving the word in English. And finally, there was also an other where participants could specify their preferred choice if it wasn't in the, in the uh, given labels. So this is what the survey looked like. So speaker, so speakers of Mandarin would see the English label. They'd see a very short description of it at the top. Then they'd be given map previews that show the label on a map, and then multiple choice uh, options corresponding to those maps. 
So just to dig into those options a little bit, um, that was an example with Ted's Bulletin, which is, a, which is actually a restaurant in the DC area that has multiple locations. And in the name Ted's Bulletin, we always have to transliterate Ted because it's just a proper name that doesn't have some lexical meaning. The apostrophe S gets dropped. That's a standard convention of converting labels from English to Chinese. And then the options range on a cline of whether things are translated or transliterated. So we offer an option with translation, but no categorizer, translation with a categorizer, then all transliteration, no categorizer, and with a categorizer. And finally, no conversion. So preferences did indeed vary by type of map feature. And with regard to translation, speakers seemed to prefer translation when it accurately indicated the type of place that was being shown. That's no surprise. There was a weak preference for translation when it conveyed some sort of geographic term, so something like park, even when it refers to a town or a neighborhood. And then when the translation was unrelated to geography, it was dispreferred. Um, speakers didn't want it. Categorizer words like mountain, restaurant, bar, they were generally beneficial. They didn't usually hurt, but they were strongly preferred for non-settlement map feature types. So with, with settlements, like I said, there was this general preference not to have a categorizer, and there also seemed to be a general preference for transliteration. Um, these are sort of intentionally difficult examples. So with Orland Park, it's not a park, it's a town. Um, with Walnut Creek, whenever I visited, I didn't see the creek, it is there, but it's underground now mostly. Um, and vista is a Spanish word that means view, but speakers would not choose the translated version because presumably the meaning of view wasn't necessarily accessible. And so speakers tended to prefer transliteration there. And in San Leandro, uh, you could see a preference for a translation of San as the word saint. And that's probably an established convention given how, how common those types of names are in California. With natural features, there's a strong preference to add a categorizing word even when it isn't present in the original label. So with El Capitan and Half Dome, there is a preference to add a categorizer mountain. And I also saw this in a pilot survey with islands. People preferred to have island even if it was, even if the name of the island didn't necessarily contain that. Um, one interesting thing when I was looking at POIs was I wanted to see the effect of an established brand name. So I compared Starbucks versus Pete's because Starbucks is widespread in China, but Pete's only has one China location. So Participants preferred, they strongly preferred the established Chinese brand name for Starbucks, and that's actually a mix of translation and transliteration. For Pete's, it seemed like speakers preferred the transliteration of Pete as Pita rather than what I was able to find on Wikipedia as presumably their preferred label conversion, which is Pia. So it shows that you can, that when a place name gets established, speakers could prefer that, but when it's less established, speakers will prefer something that is a little bit closer to the, to the English and a little more transparent. For, for restaurants um, with Henry's Restaurant, speakers strongly preferred restaurant to be translated, not transliterated. And that, and that fits with the translation being highly indicative of the type of place that it is. With Ted's Bulletin, an equal number preferred translated or transliterated, that didn't seem to make much of a difference, but there was a heavy preference to have a categorizer, like restaurant. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go on. So with, map, so with roads, highly systematic roads that whose names are organized around numbers and directions seem to show a preference for having either full translation or no conversion, not transliteration that might, for example, help you just understand the road name as it is in spoken English. And speakers strongly preferred to have a translation of a road designation term, even when that wasn't necessarily in the original label. So when, speaker, so when speakers chose other and specified something, one of the things that they independently suggested was having bilingual labels, even though that was never an option in the survey. 
And so that, that highlights the need for research like Nikki's and the viability of that option. Another thing that came up was mixing languages within a label. So for a portion that would normally be transliter transliterated, um, you could just leave that in English and then translate the rest. So in, in the future, I'd like to investigate the effects of age and profession to see if there are different preferences there. Make sure that respondents are self-consistent. Um, I've been reporting just descriptive trends based on aggregate results. There's a lot more statistical analysis and detailed investigation that you could do. And one thing that I'm quite interested in is this idea of categorizer words versus icons. Um, would icons actually obviate the need for categorizer words? And would the potential iconicity of certain Chinese characters cause a preference to, cause a trade-off for icons versus characters? Um, and iconicity is a highly problematic linguistic issue. So I just want to raise that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and questions at the end. <laughs>